Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, glad you all made it on the last day of the summit at the 4.30 slot. Pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> actually, in Vancouver, we did a talk, and it was pretty much the same situation. So uh, we're like the curtain call act after this, everyone goes home. Um, so my name is Andy McRae, um, and that's my colleague, uh, Jesse Pretorius, and uh, we both work for the development and engineering team at uh, Rackspace, working in the private cloud department. Um, we're both based in London, and in case you're picking up an accent, uh, we're both actually originally from South Africa, but when Jesse starts to talk, that's going to become a lot more apparent. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. We started around six months ago or so, looking at doing a federation um, and like a global clustering multi-region cloud solution, which we wanted to implement in the OpenStack Ansible project, which we both work on. Um, so we, we started looking at some of the options um, on how we'd uh, solve the solution or come up with a solution to solve the problems that, uh, that you, you need when, when you start talking about like multi-region clouds. Um, just to be clear, like we start all of this for Kilo, so there have been a whole bunch of improvements that Jesse's going to give mention to on, in terms of changes in Liberty. Um, but when we started doing this, it was, it was entirely Kilo. Um, I personally worked on the Swift Global Clustering uh, solution. And Jesse did a lot of work on the uh, Auth Federation stuff and identity. So I think we've got all the bases covered, hopefully. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll give it a go to try and let you guys know what we learned and some of the stuff that um, is a little bit challenging when you coming up with these solutions. So let's start at the beginning. Um, why would I even need a, a multi-region cloud? So the most obvious one is I have two physical database or data center or other locations, and I want to have a cloud in each um, that I can access. Um, so it, it's a performance issue and potentially even legal, um, because there are certain regions, for example, Germany is a really good one, where you have to have data stored inside of the country um, for certain uh, legal issues around like banking and various other things. Um, but I might want to manage my two clouds from one location, which isn't necessarily in that same place. Um, and performance wise, if I'm in a certain country, I probably don't want to be accessing a country, accessing a cloud in a country that's kilometers and kilometers away, um, because it's just not practical. You're going to get performance issues. Um, so that's the first, like most obvious region, reason. Um, So let's say you have a really large cloud and it's all in the same data center. Um, what if the cloud grows to a point that it's not manageable now? Um, we, no one really has documented how far you can get with one cloud and then before things start falling over. But depending on the resources you've got, thinking about the database and, and various other things that are finite, how do I then scale that out? Well, regions can be a pretty good way of doing that because I effectively have two clouds within the same data center or area, but they're managed kind of separately but then we put an overlay on top to manage both of them. Um, and then lastly, you might, um, you might want to segment the concerns that you have. So maybe I have a quite small cloud, but my company has two separate departments that can't use each other's resources. I can use regions to separate those out. And it's a pretty decent use case. And I think that's actually prob probably one of the use cases that is more common um, because there aren't that many clouds that scale to, to the size that you would need multiple regions. And there aren't that many people who are doing multiple data center regions um, like across the globe. So what were we actually looking for? Um, so the main thing we had was we wanted to be able to do compute um, resources in two separate regions, potentially in different data centers, um, access them in the same way. And we also wanted Swift. So we wanted a situation where I could put Objects, objects in our object storage in one data center and then retrieve them from another data center um, and vice versa. So it's a pretty simple use case. Um, we found it was useful to just start at a very small and then kind of look at what's there and, and build in from there. So federation itself raises an interesting social issue. Um, and the issue is that there's a lot of buzzwords around federation. Um, there's a lot of words that are have really strange definitions. It's not really clear what they actually mean. And in fact, in some cases, some of the words mean more than one thing, depending on what you're talking about. It makes it really, really difficult when talking to like management chain or people that aren't necessarily involved in the implementation. It, it becomes confusing, and it gets difficult to say, we're trying to achieve these things, and this is how we're going to do it, when there's like 
confusion around some of the, some of the words. Um, so, I mean, even just starting with the word federation, uh, like, people have been talking about federation within OpenStack for the last couple of years, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a buzzword. So when I looked up what federation actually means, I was a little bit surprised when it had no mention of magical cloud things, unicorns, ice creams, rainbows, and also a cure for cancer and world peace. Um, everybody's been doing federation, apparently. There's not much documentation on what they've been doing, um, and no one seems to be able to show that they've done it. So a little bit skeptical on that, but it's been an issue for two years, and it apparently solves all the cloud problems. It's not really true. Um, it's good for a couple of use cases. Um, and it does have a place, and it does solve a lot of key points. But I think that this kind of catch-all that Federation is going to solve all the problems you have with your cloud is kind of silly. Um, some of the things I spoke about, like there's confusion between words that have two separate meanings. I worked on the Swift stuff, and that's actually a perfect example. The terms in Swift for regions and zones are mirrored in Nova and that, and well, Keystone and, and the other OpenStack services, and that they also have regions and zones, but they don't actually mean the same thing. So when we talk about regions and zones in Swift, what we're actually talking about is a degree of least alikeness. So Swift uses an algorithm to replicate objects um, and accounts and containers based on the least alike available host or node. Um, and that goes from order of regions being the least alike to uh, zones, um, and then servers within a zone, and then drives within a server. So if you imagine a region as being like an area in a data center, or even a different data center, and a zone being potentially a rack within a data center, and then obviously a host is just a server and a drive within that host. And what it'll try to do is uh, replicate, uh, replicate objects rather to least alike places. So I'll, if I have two regions and I have three replicas, there will at least be one replica in each region. But in Nova, or in compute and uh, identity, when you talk about a region, what you're really talking about is different endpoints. So I would access an endpoint like region one or region two, and I'm actually just accessing a separate Nova API endpoint that controls different compute hosts. So they don't actually care too much about the other compute hosts. Whereas in Swift, what you're really talking about is one massive Swift cluster. They all replicate to each other. They all care about and have to know about each other, but they're in separate places potentially. Um, and zones is exactly the same. So availability in zones in Nova are um, groupings of compute hosts within a region. Um, I've actually had the conversation about the differences between Swift and uh, compute terminology a lot. Um, so it is, it is an issue, and actually some decisions were made on the basis that these two things are the same, and I had to go in and say, like, these are not the same things. Like, let me explain to you now that like, this, in Swift, it's still one cluster. They need to know about each other. You can't just have two sw separate Swift regions floating around that don't care about each other, which you can do with Nova. Like In Nova, I don't need to have a concept of these uh, servers in this zone know about these servers in this zone. They don't, they don't have to. And so it, it is obvious why this can be confusing to people. And it, it becomes especially difficult when people making decisions on products and various other things aren't involved in, in kind of the implementation side of it. There's a couple other important terms, um, mostly around authentication um, and identity. So things like projects or tenants, um, a little bit confusing because the name changed and then it kind of changed back again. Um, but essentially, it's a grouping of resources within uh, the identity service. Um, and then you have domains, which are the owner of projects. And then there's users and groups, but I think those are reasonably self-explanatory. And it's changing again. Yeah. As always. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's some confusion around the Keystone terms because they kind of keep changing and from V2 to V3 the terms are different and back when it was before Keystone Lite they were different and yeah. So when we started looking at this it became obvious really early on that the main issue is about identity. Um, how can I auth against both clouds is, is the real issue. If you imagine you had two regions and in separate data centers across the globe, or more than two even, and you had no authentication at all, like it was just open for everyone, there's actually really no issue, aside from I need to have a way to specify where I'm accessing the resources from. Um, because I, I don't have to auth, it doesn't care, like the users are all the same, and um, it, it will just work. So now that we know we need to auth, um, how do we do that? And the problem really is that the way Nova and Swift work, or not just Nova, but other OpenStack services, um, is quite different. Um, it, it goes back to the concept that a global cluster in, in Swift is actually just one 
entity um, that's just really large. And in Nova, it's two separate regions, two separate API endpoints, separate sets of compute hosts um, that don't care about each other. And that creates some issues because in Swift, the way it creates your user account, the way you access your objects, is based on uh, the project or tenant ID. And if we store that outside, if we store that within the cluster, um, the IDs and the project ID or tenant ID will be different for each region. And the problem with that is that although the data underneath is being replicated and is technically in the other region, it's not accessible by any users there because the user that created it is in region A. So even if I had the exact same user that authenticated in the same way and could use resources in the same way for Nova, if they came from different clouds where the tenant and project ID didn't sync, um, you wouldn't be able to access the same objects. In fact, you'd be able to get two separate sets of objects depending on which region you were accessing from for the exact same user. And um, that means that you're a bit limited as to how uh, you can do the authentication. Um, and, and that's actually one of the key issues that, that we found almost really early on. So the thing is that Nova doesn't care. And there are other solutions. So there is a solution for Swift, which is container sync. Um, it's a little bit of an older solution than the global clustering. And it's essentially having two separate Swift installs that then just sync containers. So that is a possibility. You can add it to the Swift pipeline, and it will essentially give a list of um, of the other clouds that you want to sync to, and it'll sync certain containers. But it's got a different overhead. Like the management overhead for it is actually a, a little bit more. Like you have to specify when you create containers that they're synced. It doesn't just happen automatically like it will with regions. Um, so hopefully I've framed the issue a bit so um, you have an idea of what we're trying to solve for and some of the brief issues we've had. And um, Jesse's just going to run through um, some of the ways we approached the issues and, and some of the things we found uh, when, we, when we were implementing. So there are a number of ways we can approach the problem. And uh, dealing with identity, uh, ideally, we want to have a common source, at the very least, a common source for the project IDs, because that's for, for the Swift use case, project IDs for a global cluster that you want to access stuff, the same stuff in both sides. That the project IDs, at the very least, need to be the same. So there, there is a stable um, solution to the, there are two stable solutions to the problem. The one is you replicate your, your identity database. So uh, there may be people in the room that have even tried this. It's a bit expensive. Um, running a Galera cluster, cluster across multiple data centers, uh, potentially across multiple countries, it can get expensive because it's a per transaction uh, replication process. You might do something that's a little bit more of a bulk differential move, which is periodic. But then the data object I just put in region A is not yet available in region B. Um, and it'll only be there in five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, you know, whatever the process is. So that's not exactly ideal. Um, but that's one way you can do it. The other issue with that process is that um, you are essentially having to run this global cluster and you've only got one internal data source to look at uh, for identity. You've also got to carry the identity um, information. So that's, that has other implications from an audit, security, and management overhead standpoint. So that's one, one other thing to consider. And then depending on how you're, you're running your keystone, depending on the token method that you're using, it may get very expensive because of token revocation um, and also just making sure that the same token can be used across both, both regions. So ultimately, database replication is practical. It works. We all know it works. It's a fairly well-known solution, but it's expensive expensive in many different ways. Then we could use an LDAP backend. Uh, LDAP's also uh, directory services are a pretty well-known uh, uh, service that are used to replicate in, uh, across WANs, vast areas. Uh, it's pretty well-known to infrastructure engineers. So that, again, is a pretty well-known uh, solution to this problem and can solve that, but 
the Keystone LDAP integration backend is not great. Um, anybody who's worked with it will probably vouch for that. The code is a bit of a mess. The Keystone team know about it. They're trying to, trying to improve it, but they'd rather actually do something which, which we think is a, a better solution, and that is make the identity and author the authentication process something else's problem. The advantage of doing that as well is that it could, not, it could be not just one other entity's problem, it could be many entities' problems. So then you only have the challenge of setting up a trust. So, and it's, it's quite a different workflow. Federation is also, it means many things to diff many people, as Andy's already said. So it's a new technology, it's definitely very fresh in OpenStack. And that was most definitely a challenge that we hit. Not a lot of documentation, not a lot of experience in the community using it. Um, the entities using it, you know, there's a bit of travel knowledge, but not a lot of explicit knowledge. But if you can outsource your, the identity management portion of things, and you can, um, th then the, your focal point becomes, um, a, it's, out of Keystone. Keystone also doesn't have to be the endpoint for authentication, it doesn't have to manage that. Um, so the overhead's a lot lower. Right. Another problem with using something like, um, if you're using, uh, if you have one region or one cloud, if you want to call it that. One installation with a common Keystone database, it only scales so far. So maybe you do another one and you don't care so much that you've got, uh, the objects are replicating, so you've got a nice little DR scenario. Uh, your objects are over there and maybe you are prepared to go and restore your database, your Keystone database over there, so you can access it and that's part of your DR process. That's great. But what happens when you hit that scale issue again? Then you build another one. Now you've got three to manage. Now it just grows and grows and grows. Ultimately, that just doesn't feel like a good solution. There must be something better. So if you're centralizing the authentication, uh, we've discussed the, uh, the Galera bits. We've discussed the LDAP bits. Um, if you're using federation, then you've got to deal with the, uh, the new tech. So that's a different cost, but it could be managed um, in a different way. And Federation is becoming more of a common use case. Um, and actually, one of the nice things about working with OpenStack Ansible um, is that you guys can actually use that as a reference point for how to configure stuff. So our playbooks and our templates have now become kind of a documented way to do it. Please feel free to do so. Right, so one of the great things about working with the Federation is that the identity issue is outside of Keystone. The endpoint for authentication and potentially authorization is also outside of Keystone. So that takes away the identity issue, but it doesn't take away the project ID issue. So the thing is that if you're replicating your Keystone database, it, even if you've taken the identity auth authentication out of Keystone's domain, you still have a problem when you're working with something like Swift, you still have a project ID that's used as a container name. So you're still sitting with a situation where um, it ha to access it across both, the auth might be fine, but now you have an access point issue. Um, and the reality is that today, well, today, as of stable kilo today, that is not a solution that can be solved with Federation. As of stable liberty today, we haven't verified, but it doesn't look like it. Right? So what that actually means is, if you want to do a global cluster, 
you are kind of stuck with using something else as well. Not good news. Right. So the reality is we have to use the best of both worlds for now, at least. The, the Keystone project database does need to be synced, but the nice thing is that you can sync your Keystone database. If you're using Federation, the identity bits are outsourced. If you also add in another, another feature that was added for, um, for Kilo, which is to use Fernade tokens instead of UUIDs, then you're sitting in a situation where your tokens on your database e either. So now you're sitting in a situation where the replication is not as expensive, and that's cool. So it's not so bad. The solution is still a bit complex, but it's not so bad. Another option, of course, that you could use is you just have one identity cluster somewhere. So you have one common access point uh, held in one place or perhaps in two regions, but they are close together enough that the expense is not so bad, at least from a data, um, a data transaction point of view. Right. So, mentioned a few lessons learned. One of the lessons we learned was that product teams don't understand the same terminology in the same way that we do. So, that's, that's a little bit of fun. Another thing we learned is that uh, federation authentication for Keystone is not in the clients. Once you have your token, you can do stuff but getting the token is not yet baked. Um, work is ongoing in the Keystone teams. The, the guys are doing a lot of work there. Um, I haven't checked on the, the status in the latest Liberty bits yet, but last I saw, there were still issues trying to use the OpenStack client to actually authenticate to a SAML source I think the ORDC source might be a little bit better, um, and I think Red Hat's done quite a bit of work to get Kerberos working. Another thing that's a lesson learned is that when you're using Federation, you suddenly don't have a user unless you choose to actually fix an external user to an internal user. So it becomes a little weird when you, as, a, as an administrator, looking in your cloud and you're trying to identify you're trying to map a, something that was created to a user account. There is no user account. You can't see it. If you look in your logs, you'll see that there is an identifier, but it's whatever the identity provider chose to share as an identifier. So the control for what the, the ID for the user is is outside of your domain. That takes a bit of getting used to. And from an administration or a control standpoint, it takes it means that you actually have to change the way you work a little and figure that out. Right, it's not as simple as, uh, as you may be used to. Yeah, I think from, from this website as well, um, some of the issues we had were around implementation. Um, so again, because there's the concept of one whole cluster that's deployed, um, which is kind of different to how you would think of federated uh, regions, in that they're separate entities, um, it, it means that when I go to deploy a cloud with Swift in it, I've got two clouds with Swift in it that need to know about all the other Swift nodes in order to replicate. So do I just deploy one large Swift cloud and then maybe change um, the proxy servers per region? Um, do I deploy Swift in two regions and then have to separately and then have to uh, sync them up by uh, you know adding the ring and the and the um, SSH like auth keys and things to each of the Swift hosts in both regions. Um, there's a couple of tricky ways to, that you could that you run into um, tricky things that you run into when it comes to implementing implementing Swift itself. Um, and again, one of the things we we considered quite early on is that perhaps it's an application issue. Like you could quite easily solve this um, by pushing the authentication problem to your application. Um, it's not the best solution in terms of management, but it is a solution that could work for you. If you code into your application that you are calling from two separate clouds with separate auth details, it would still work for you. Um, so, I mean, there are a couple other things that you could do to push this away from being an OpenStack issue. Um, but 
again, as Jesse said, like the, the overhead that you start to gain is just too much to make, to make it useful unless you have only potentially two regions or very small use cases, basically. So another thing is for the federation bits, uh, we decided to use uh, SAML as the, the uh, federation um, protocol. And uh, there are two ways to, to implement Keystone as a federated service provider. Uh, the one is using uh, mod auth melon. Oh, just by the way, basically what Keystone does is outsources the authentication portion to a plugin. So you can write your own plugin if you want, and that might think, make things simpler. But for SAML, you have two options, mod auth melon or the shibboleth plugin. We picked the shibboleth one because it was the best documented at the time. Uh, took a while to make it go, included, including having to read source code, C source code. Uh, it wasn't fun because shibboleth is largely used in the education community. Um, the documentation is sparse, and that that is there is often out of date. So trying to figure out how to make it work, that was a lot of fun. We've done that for you, though, so <laughs> we keep it simple. That said, we haven't done a perfect implementation either because there are just a lot of options, and uh, we will try over time to make it a little bit simpler and use a bit more of the functionality there. But it's a bit scary running through that stuff. Anything else? Yep, I think that's it. Um, so we just wanted to quickly uh, talk about the OpenStack Ansible project, which is where um, the stuff that we've done for the global clustering for Swift and the federation work for Keystone um, is. So we've got the link up there for the, for the GitHub repo. Um, it's in the OpenStack namespace now. Um, one of the other things is that when, because federation is a reasonably complex thing, um, some of the options and how you actually set it up is a lot more difficult than we'd like it to be. Um, kind of as Jesse mentioned, it's not the perfect implementation and we'd love it to be simplified. Um, and another, another caveat is that no one's actually used it as like a production thing. Um, we kind of more got it in there to show that it works and this is a way we could do it. Um, and it, it does work um, and it's a good start point. Um, so yeah. yeah. Consider it experimental for now. <laughs> um, we have some documentation up as well. Uh, the docs are referenced from that URL. Uh, we covered Keystone to Keystone Federation, um, so that's Keystone as an IDP. And if you don't know this already, Keystone is not a very good IDP. Um, kind of intentionally so, um, because there are other more mature IDPs out there. But what we've done will work with a standard shibboleth IDP, and will work with Microsoft ADFS 3. Um, both of those, um, both of those are, uh, support SAML too. Right. And another thing, just on the Ansible thing, um, really quickly, is that even if you don't want to use the OpenStack Ansible project for this, um, or you're using some other deployment tool, um, you can have a look at the roles and tasks. They're pretty clear cut in Ansible. It's quite easy to look at, and you could see how we're doing it, and then just take that and repeat it, or give it a go and see if if it, if it looks good to you. Yeah, as far as I recall, the Puppet community is already building stuff uh, which references the stuff that we did. <laughs> yeah, I think at this point, uh, I think we've got just over 10 minutes left, so if there are any questions, um, yeah, we thought we'd have yeah. a picture of a federation gone bad. Um, <laughs> Don't trust that guy. <laughs> And uh, if you do want to ask questions, there's a mic in the front, um, if you yep. could, if you could use that. Um, is the uh, federation done on a per domain basis still, or is it everything or nothing? And uh, also, how do you go about doing role assignments? Like with, the, with LDAP, if you can do, you know, you map to, to a group, but if you can't see the groups, how do you assign roles? Yeah. So that's part of the admin overhead. Um, so. Federation or any of the stuff that's outsourced from an authentic authentication point of view for Keystone. Uh, it, Keystone has a mapping engine, um, which is kind of like its very own scripting engine. 
It's a little bit of fun to figure out. Um, during the process of figuring it out, uh, we interacted with the Keystone guys to make it better. So you're welcome. The documentation is better now. Um, but essentially, you map, you can map an external user based on whatever the IDP is sharing um, and whatever you've chosen as a user associated ID um, from what the IDP is sharing. This is all chosen on a per IDP basis. You can map that to an existing user if you want. So if you already have a user in your database, you can connect that, those two dots. If you do that, then that user is already members of projects, domains, etc. It will inherit those. So that is an easy way, but it's obviously not going to be the way that's going to... It's not the only way. The way that we chose to implement it, our sort of base example use case is that um, if a user comes in and has... If a user comes in as a federated user, it gets membership to a group, that group has access to projects and domains. Right. So, so as far as I know, the only way to do that mapping at the moment, I don't think you can map users to domains. You have to map them to a group, and the group has a membership to the domain. As far as I know, that's the only way right now. So it's map a user to a user or a user to a group. Another caveat is that Keystone v3 is the only way this works. You cannot do it with Keystone v2. Move along. <laughs> yeah, we actually didn't mention that. Um, there are some issues like with getting some of the services to work happily with, uh, with Keystone v3 um, as of Kilo. I think, to be honest, most of them have been resolved now. Um, that Keystone yeah. 3 is more mature, I guess. Um, but there were some issues around that as well. Yeah, so we... Keystone as a v3 endpoint only does not work in Kilo, but it does work in Liberty. Um, they may backport the patches. It's largely the projects themselves that hadn't quite fully implemented using Keystone v3. Is there public service accounts that support domain? Is that for users only? Sorry? Is that just basically public service accounts, those things that didn't support v3 in the default domain? Yeah. So, well, that's the way we've implemented it, uh, partially because it's a known way of doing things and it's simple. Um, we haven't gone to the extent of testing whether the service accounts could be in other domains. Um, we may embark on that adventure, but I think there are different problems that are more interesting to solve at this point. Any other questions? How are we on time? We good? Yeah, we got, there's a couple of minutes left, but cool. if there are any questions, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>